recognize the chair of the IPOE in Africa activities and uh, the committee on that. Vincent, uh, I can't let you sit without uh, introducing you. And uh, I must, in fact, even invite you to say a few words. I've just been promoting IPOE, but no one does it better than Vincent. So maybe Professor Rose, just so that you don't stand for so long, uh, just ask okay. Vincent to say a few words oh, sure, yeah. and then we can get started. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming here this morning to give uh, you this uh, activity. And uh, jointly by ITP, UIP, and most especially, we have to thank uh, Dr. Rose from the Activity from the Communication Society. Uh, as Dorothy has mentioned, uh, this is not an effort that ITP is actively run in Africa. Uh, we have we were set up by uh, it was an appointed, committee appointed by the actual president initially in 2010 and it's been building continuously. Uh, Uganda is one of five focus countries where actually is actually secondly uh, used as a launch pad to expand our presence in Africa. We're doing three major things. One is expanding and uh, supporting uh, engineering capacity for education, as we are for the kind of activities we're having today. The other is also um, strengthening our communities on the ground and we are going to the ground to you guys because you are the people actually get this work done. And, uh, and, and the idea here is that we, need, we actually do not need to have people solving our problems, we need to get our own engineers to fix these problems, right? So that the sons and people need it. The third piece of it is working with the people that, 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 that we say are in the enabling environment. Our national 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 engineering societies like the UIB, like the uh, regulators, and the national government, and uh, we're really excited that uh, um, you have been able to come and be a part of this. We hope you continue to be a part of this. Uh, how many of the folks that are currently here are already I two forty members? Maybe they can stand up for recognition. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. You are the pioneers, and we encourage you to share what you know, this secret that you know with the rest of the folks here present, because we'd like to actually grow the community and, and, and become pretty vibrant. We're hoping to do a lot more exciting things in the future, and uh, we hope that you'll all be a part of them. I would like to thank uh, Professor Gwyn in a very special way. Uh, she's actually doing a marathon across the region. <laughs> you wouldn't tell by looking. <laughs> But we're really, really, really excited to have you here, and we hope that uh, you, you, you will be carrying some of your uh, wonderful experiences from our region uh, back to the council. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope those are few words. <laughs> and uh, like I said, and I promise you, he will tell you so much more about IP than I could. So uh, I think, in the interest of time, uh, Professor. Rose, uh, I'll let you take the floor. Yes. And you can get. So I think visibility is okay for everybody. Some people may have to be strategic not to sit behind this board, oh, but uh, right. okay. but I will try to make my voice as loud as possible so that people can hear me clearly. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Dolphin and Vincent, for your nice introduction. Yeah, I, I think I'm very proud of representing H4 this time to come over to this region and uh, to represent uh, IEEE actually to promote research, particularly in uh, uh, 5G uh, wireless communications. So this time actually, uh, as you can see, uh, my research is mainly about uh, uh, next generation uh, wireless communications and the internet of things. So thanks to IEEE uh, who gave me this chance actually to come over here to present my research and also actually to promote IEEE. It would be great to see the IEEE's presence to get more and more recognized and more and more popular in uh, East Africa, which is now in the country. So I would like to contribute to that and by promoting my research. So this actually, by saying that, uh, today actually I'm going to do uh, some brief introduction on my research by selecting some of my recent actual research outcomes. So a lot by recognizing we have a good mix here, uh, we have undergraduate students, we have graduate students, we have faculty members, and we also have students from other disciplines. So this is what I'm going to do. So I will stay on a high level to introduce my research by explaining, you know, background, for example, what are the motivations for the research and what are the key directions to 
pursue uh, pretty much at a high level. But a lot of the slides and the topics here are really deep research level. So I probably leave lots of detailed research solutions to offline discussion if you're really interested into that depth, actually. Because most of the work here, uh, that has been done by, by myself, together with my PhD students, as well as postdoctor researchers. So if you're really interested in, in the depth, I will be very, very glad to share the papers, the slides, and also you know, to have discussions with you if you're interested in that level. So let's just start my talk. So I'm going to introduce the key wireless access technologies in 5G. So 5G represent, represents the fifth generation wireless communication networks. So if we talk about fifth generation, then obviously we know we have first generation, second generation, third generation, and fourth generation. And for example, when I landed in Uganda, I turned my cell phone, I see my roommate turned on, then I see 3G. So basically it means 3G is pretty much the key wireless technology that has been deployed here. But I also believe maybe in some regions uh, in, in this country or in other countries, for example in Kenya, I came from Kenya yesterday. So Kenya, I see in some regions they also have 4G. So now today you have a good mix of 3G, 4G, and also in some regions I see 2G as well. So it's, it's a combination of different generations. But 5G is the technology we are developing right now. It's not commercially deployed, but it's under de development, research. So hopefully by 2020, we should have our first commercially deployed 5G network somewhere. So that actually, and also IoT system. So one of the key applications in 5G system is IoT. So we see the popularity of IoT uh, is getting more and more higher and higher these days. So IoT, we know that represents Internet of Things. So we know Internet of Things is everywhere. Basically, the intention of Internet of Things is really to provide, we call that three air, a three any, right? Anytime, anywhere, and anyhow. So no matter where you are, no matter when you are, and no matter you know what kind of environment you are in, you are promised to get into connected to the system by various technologies. So that actually is really what 5G and IoT are developing these days. So now we're talking about what are the key technologies. So when we talk about 5G, 5G is not a single technology, keep that in your mind. It's just like an umbrella of various technologies all together. It's a combination, it ranges from, for example, you talk about the chip technology, it's part of 5G. You talk about chip solutions, which actually is built in your, for example, the cell phone, right? When you open the cell phone, you see the chip is inside. And also when you go to base stations, there are a lot of chips inside. So it ranges from chip, and also from a device uh, companies such as Apple, such as Samsung, such as Huawei, that provide all those you know, devices. And also go to infrastructure like base stations. Uh, the typical companies are Ericsson. Uh, I'm not sure if Ericsson has presence here. Like, for example, all great. So Ericsson, Huawei, have you heard about Huawei? Yes, great. They're pretty much the number two, one of two companies for the infrastructure these days. So they're producing base stations. So then also you go to, go to the network side, they're also part of 5G Cisco. I believe everyone has heard about Cisco. It, it has been there for a long time. It's a joint internet company. And also those you know, application companies such as Google. We know Google definitely when I open my uh, computer, just like every time you search, you use Google. Like Google, Apple, and uh, a lot of other companies. So all those different companies, they come to also, as well as like the uh, federal uh, spectrum regulation. Uh, uh, for example, here, I'm, I'm not sure what's the uh, government agency who regulates the spectrum. Like in the United States, we have ACC, same UCC. 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 Oh, UCC. Yeah, that's Very CC good. something starts with a different <laughs> level. Yeah. So, all, you know, we have like government, industry, academia. So, various, you know, well, all those different uh, people, different companies, different universities, government agencies, we work together these days to make 5G and possibly 6G, 7G, well, when time goes on, of course. So we, may, we are developing all these technologies together. But today, actually, I'm more talking about from my research perspective, and also because myself, I have uh, 10 years industrial working experience. I was working with Intel. 
I think the Intel is uh, like the, you have a laptop or you have Intel inside. So I was working with Intel, I was working with BlackBerry. Anybody heard about BlackBerry? Wow, great. I was working with BlackBerry when BlackBerry was like at the peak, that was 2008. Pretty much that was the king of uh, smartphone at that time. And also I was working with, with one of the companies, one of the biggest uh, telecommunication company in North America, which is called Nortel. I'm not sure how many people here knows Nortel anymore. So that was like uh, three, there were three big telecommunication companies in North America. One is Lucent, that was part of AT&T. And one is Motorola, I think that's probably more popular because Motorola has phones. And you probably know that a lot as end users. And the other one is called Nortel. So those are three big giants of uh, telecommunication vendors in North America. So I, myself, I came from industry, so that's why my research, I can share my view from research perspective as well as from industry development perspective, how those technologies will be developed and what will be the future technology, even beyond 5G, that's what we talk about, 5G beyond or 6G. We really want to mention the name of 6G. <laughs> so, but to put that, not surprisingly, actually, yes, people are talking about the 6G now. So I was among the first person who was talking about 5G, that was five years ago. We talked about 5G, first time we brought up 5G, we published papers, then now 5G has become a reality. Now it's time to talk about 6G, and we do hear lots of people from, such as Ericsson, Huawei, that talk about 6G now. So, not surprisingly, if I do have a chance next time to come together again, maybe after two years, my research probably will become 6G instead of 5G. <laughs> it's very possible. So now I come back to my topic. So first I want to introduce the motivation and the objectives of the research. Because we have talked about the evolution of wireless communication development. So first we start with first generation. We know that first generation, that was actually back in the 80s. Probably most of you, I don't know, not most of you, a lot of you here were not even born yet. That was uh, the first generation of a cellular network just started. That actually is based on analog FDMA. So frequency division multiplexing analog based. Then we move to second generation. That's probably the starting of the 90s. And we have GSM technology. It's still using these days GSM technology. And that's actually become digital technology, digital PDMA based, that's second generation. Now third generation, that's what you are using here. That's what I saw in my phone. So third generation is mainly based on CDMA. I hope you know. When time move on different technologies, what are the key fundamental technologies you know, that support different generations? So when we go to third generation, it's CDMA based. So CDMA represents code division multiplexing. It's just different, you know, modulation technologies. So now 4G, 4G is pretty much you, you can see everywhere, when you, whenever you, wherever you go. So that's actually LTE called. So long-term evolution technology. That's based on OFDMA, which is called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing technology. So that's 4G. Now, actually, when we move to 5G, well, first let's talk about what are the key motivations behind to drive 5G. Because 4G is, is I can tell you that 4G has very excellent technology. So we have developed all those advanced uh, modulation technologies, coding technologies antenna technologies and all those advanced networking technologies to make a 4G LT a reality these days. But when we realized that, well, at, you know, five years ago, people realized that when we project into the future, one thing become very, very promising and emerging quickly, that's IoT, which is Internet of Things. So when this Internet of Things, and of course together with lots of new applications enabled by IoT, we realized that quickly, the capacity of LTE will reach its limit. So we realized that you know, 10 years ahead, for example, while the network is not just you know, demanding 10 times capacity or 20 times capacity, that's actually what we see from 2G, 1G to 2G, 2G to 3G, 3G to 4G. The capacity needs actually we see, oh, 10 times, doubles, or well, I don't know, maximally, probably 100 times. But when we change from LTE to fifth, gen fifth generation, we claim that quickly we need a thousand times capacity, very, very quickly. So number one, we need a very, very high capacity due to all those 
IoT type of, type of applications and also new applications. We know that these days, new applications, I wouldn't say emerge every day, but new applications, you do see that definitely every year, right? Very, very brand new applications every year. So those applications could be just banned with ITER. So in that case, you know, we really, really need, need high capacity to support new applications and to support IoT type of devices. So that's number one uh, driven uh, motivation behind. Number two, well, traditionally, I'm not sure, you know, when we talk about wireless communications here, if you're from, for example, particularly this field, traditionally, when we design a wireless system, number one performance index has been spectrum efficiency, meaning how we utilize the limited spectrum resources and packing as many users as possible. Why do we need to do that? Because wireless communications use man-made, uh, natural resources, it's not man-made resources. We know wireless use man-made resources, right? We use cable, we use fiber. You can make as many as you want, and you can get a lot of bandwidth from by deploying as many as fibers you want. But for wireless, you cannot do that. Why? Wireless is a natural resource. It's given. It's not you can make. So it's limited, first. And since it's natural, since it's limited, so what you can do is to use this, you know, given resource, natural resource, then maximize your capacity, maximize your efficiency. So that has been traditionally number one performance metrics. We try to maximize, which is spectral efficiency. But now when we go to 5G, actually people realize that just talk about spectral efficiency is not sufficiently enough. Now energy efficiency becomes equivalently important. Why? Because we, well, number one, we want our environment to be green, right? So when we deploy more and more devices, base stations, routers, gateways, all those, you know, different things, they consume energy. And they consume energy first to produce lots of environmental pollutions. It could be that way. And second, of course, it costs you bills. And third, it can cause damage or uh, human being health concern. For example, if you use device and you really want to reduce your power to reduce the uh, radiation. So all this together, actually, in 5G, energy efficiency becomes the key concern, as well as together with spectral efficiency. So that actually becomes number two, you know, the motivation behind how we can design a system which is not only spectral efficient, but also energy efficient. So that's number two. Number three, well, because we have, or well, traditionally, let's go back to traditional network. The traditional network has many designed for human to human communications. That has been actually, well, if you go back to traditional telephony network, it's human to human communication. Traditional 1G, 2G, 3G, even 4G, they are men or human to human communications. But when we go to 5G, we realize that the communication is not just for human to human. Well, it could be human to machine, machine to machine. Actually, machine to machine type of application we, uh, we, uh, will become actually the major communication form for IoT type of uh, applications. Like we have sensors everywhere, and those little sensors, they talk to each other, communicate with each other, instead of human to human talk to each other. And also you want to make your environment smart. For example, you want to develop smart environment, smart buildings, smart house, smart city, smart country. And you want to develop uh, uh, unmanned uh, autonomous driving. We all know that, know that, right? So no human actually is getting involved in those type of applications. So you have tons of devices which actually have uh, sensors uh, equipped in them. And those sensors, they detect the environment, they sense the environment, they collect information, they communicate the information to maybe nearby uh, fusion center or data center, then process it, they make decision, and th th this decision will make, uh, well, depending on what kind of uh, application you're using, certainly will make your, uh, well, the whole environment or whole, whole system, the whole uh, building much, much more intelligent. So that actually gives us the number three motivation of designing the future wireless network, which is what we call massive connectivity. So we really want the network to support massive connectivity. 
So massive connectivity, well, if you compare, why we call massive? Because you need to compare the volume, the co connected volume uh, for human-to-human -human communication and machine-to-machine -machine communication. Because the human-to-human -human communication, well, traditional the scale of doing that, well, we have 7 billion people in the whole world, right? But if you talk about machine-to-machine -machine type of applications, well, by 2020, this scale is expected to be 50 billion. And the projection is going up exponentially. Well, we will not, we will not see human beings' population going up like this, right? If it's going up like this, well, we'll be big trouble. <laughs> the world, you know, the whole Earth may not be able to support a certain number. But machine-to-machine -machine type of applications, well, this really, really goes up in certain ways, like that. So in that case, actually, your communication network needs to connect all those sensors, connect all those devices into the network. Then the scale of the connectivity definitely is different, you know, from much higher, different in the sense that it is much, much higher than the traditional communication network. So that's why, that's key, well, of course, we have a lot of other key performance index, but these three are related to what we are talking about. So first, spectral efficiency, second, the energy efficiency, third, massive connectivity. So when we design a wireless access technology, we need to consider these three key performance index in our mind. So how your new uh, technology can address either one of these, two of these, or all of three together. But one thing I want to uh, let you know as a general rule of uh, design, it actually happens in various system design, not just in wireless communication system. In all kinds of system design, when we talk about multiple performance objectives, we know that. And when we try to satisfy all those performance objectives or maximize them, normally what we can do is what we need to do trade-off, right? Because the maximization or optimization of one performance index normally sacrifices the other one. So if you want to really take care of all this group together, then most likely what you need to do is to trade off monthly. So I can give you just a simple way to interpret it that is, I don't know like uh, if we are familiar with the Shannon formula. If you really go to Shannon formula, for example, Shannon formula actually gives you the point-to-point -point communication, you know, the capacity definition for a uh, noisy channel. So if you use that formula, just do a simple calculation to see what's the spectral efficiency for a point-to-point -point channel and what's the energy efficiency for the point-to-point -point channel. Well, spectral efficiency is defined as uh, bits per second per hertz, right? Bits per second represents what? It represents throughput. So this throughput given one hertz, how much you can support. So that gives you the spectral efficiency definition. Then energy efficiency usually is defined as bits per second per joule. Given one joule, how many throughput it can support. So you can actually get this definition just simply from shadow capacity. And then do the comparison, how these two actually will play with each other. Then it's very interesting, that if you plot the curve, spectral efficiency versus energy efficiency comparison curve, I can tell you that the curve will just look like this. What does that mean? Your x-axis, for example, is spectral efficiency, your y-axis is energy efficiency. Meaning, well, if your spectral efficiency is access, it keeps going up, your energy efficiency keeps going down. Okay. Meaning, well, if you want to achieve the maximum spectral efficiency, then your energy efficiency will be practically zero. If you really want to achieve the highest spectral efficiency, then your energy efficiency is practically zero. So this just gives you a you know, simple way to understand how different performance metrics in the point-to-point -point channel, how they play with each other. And as a general rule, that's what we say here pretty much for all the system design. And especially today we talk about wireless communication system. If you really want to achieve massive connectivity, spectral efficiency, energy efficiency, and in the future you have lots of other things keep playing into a picture, then we have to be very smart to tell you, well, in order to play all those boards in one hand, how you're going to design your system, right? Well, definitely it's not just like purely energy efficiency. If it's purely energy efficiency, then you realize, oh, my energy efficiency big trouble. If it's purely for energy efficiency, then my spectral efficiency is probably in big trouble. Or if I just literally want to take care of my connectivity, then most likely your spectral efficiency probably is in big trouble. So you need to play all this thing together. I just give you the general philosophy. Okay, when we design a system like that, what do we need to do? But let's come back to 
Well, I usually spend a lot of time on the first picture because that gives you a lot of high level knowledge to see, you know, to look into the future and to understand the state of the art and to see what motivates us for the research. I think for, uh, especially actually for PhD students, that's actually usually, usually what I give to my students, that PhD level. So usually, you know, that at the starting point of their PhD research, I really want to let them understand in general, okay, what's happening in the segment. What kind of problems you are dealing with. Okay? Instead of jumping to one specifically, define a problem and try to solve that problem. Just try to understand what kind of, you know, big things you are dealing with. Then understanding the state of art, understanding the history, and possibly understanding what may happen in the future. Then they have a better vision and better understanding to define a good problem, you know, to solve a well, target important technology. So now, by saying that, let's come back to our second line. So what are really the key technologies we are designing for 5G? Well, 4G is LTE, we know that, right? 4G represents long-term evolution. When we go to 5G, we have a number of technologies. But some of the key technologies are listed here, and those technologies are what I'm doing research at these days. So number one, Massive MIMO. So Massive MIMO, well, first Massive, we have heard this terminology already, large number of MIMO, right? So Massive MIMO really represents, well, today, MIMO is multiple input, multiple output. So this MIMO is corresponding to size of single input, single output. What does single input, single output mean? So for example, if I have my device, it talks to the base station, right? If both device, both sides, the, the, your, your device and the base station both only have one antenna, that's called single input, single output communication. But this knob is what we are doing definitely. We want more efficiency. So what we are doing is we implement multiple antennas at base station, multiple antennas at your device. So that these multiple antennas, they can create multiple streams simultaneously. So just on one physical resource, instead of transmitting one stream, then you can transmit multiple streams. Of course, you know, you have to design this transmission intelligently so that, you know, these multiple streams will not interfere with each other. Okay. So that actually is what we are doing today already, starting from pretty much 3G, we have my mind. But into 5G, we call it massive MIMO. So the difference here is massive. Well, why? Because today, base station, well, the massive number pretty much is 64. 64 antennas on one base station. Well, on your device, I believe probably it's two, okay? Two, maximally, probably four. I don't know if any phone has four antennas. But most commonly seen on your device, one or two antennas. So this creates 64 to one or two antenna communication. But going to the future, we want this number to be greatly increased, especially on your device. Well, why? Because today, my device is small, right? Everybody has this device in your hand, small size. Given the size, well, probably two antennas, that would be pretty much you can do. But in the future, we have various technologies to make it possible that you have 64 antennas on one single device, small device. So this creates, you know, 64 antennas on your single device. On the base station, you probably have, well, today our target is 256 antennas. Maybe going to the future, you have 1,000 antennas or even higher. So this great number of antennas will make this simultaneous stream communication much higher than today. Today you have probably, say, four streams going on simultaneously. Eight streams already probably is reaching the maximum. But in the future, we'll make this simultaneous stream much, much higher. Well, of course, you know, by doing that, we can achieve higher spectral efficiency, right? Because more simultaneous communication streams can ongoing simultaneously. Your well, throughput goes up, but your spectral efficiency goes up, and your connectivity goes up as well. Because you can connect more users into the system at one time on the same physical resource. So that actually is what we call massive multi-use and MIMO technology in the future for 5G. And the number two, device-to-device -device communications. <coughs> well, device-to-device -device communications, well, this actually is uh, very much popular these days when we talk about that. How many people here have heard about device-to-device -device communication for 5G? Great. Well, we know that this definitely is getting popular. 
So device to device communication. Well, let's do a comparison here. Today, for example, if I have an audience in this room, well, I'd say that we have 50 audience in this room. Well, if one person wants to talk to the person just next to him, they have like practically zero, right, distance. Well, if this person wants to make a phone call to the person next to him, well, what it does today is the person's device, well, the signal will go to base station first. The base station could be very far away, one well, kilometer away. But, well, even though these two persons, they're very close to each other, the signal from one person will always go to the base station. Then the base station will transmit the signal back to the person just next to him. Well, make it even worse. For example, I'm doing international roaming, right? And I want to talk to the person next to me right now. My signal can, it's possible, well, depending on if my registration, how my registration, you know, roaming registration is done. My signal could always go back to US. Yeah, that's possible. And then the signal will always come to the person just, you know, probably half a meter away from me. Think about those kind of communications, you know. This is what it is done today. But when we go to 5G, we want to make the system really smart. Really smart in the sense that they allow device to know who are their neighbors. What's their neighbor? Uh, what's, what's in their neighboring uh, environment? If they detect the user he wants to talk to is in say 50 meters or within 50 meters, then we'll try to establish the connection dire directly by passing the base station. So that your communication, actually by doing that, you can see lots of advantages, right? First, well, you are talking to the person instead of one kilometers away, but you are talking to the entity just a half meter away. Your power is greatly saved. Okay, that's number one. Number two, well, because you are talking to the person next to you, your power is very small. Then you are causing practically zero interference to others. Why, why we say that? Just imagine, okay, we have 50 people here. I always use that example. Okay. Instead of every people talk to, very loudly to each other, practically nobody can hear any people clearly. But if you try to, for example, your communication is just the person next to you, you just, just whisper, use a very, very small voice. That's your power going down, right? And your neighbor can still hear you clearly, but this person, whoever not next to you, they cannot, they have no way to hear what you're talking about. So by doing that, actually, well, interference is very small. You are not causing interference to others. And by doing that, all the people in this room, if they lower down their voice, they can talk to their communicating, we, we call that the communication partner. They can talk to their communication partner simultaneously, all 50 people here, okay? And uh, without triggering strong interference. So that's pretty much exactly what we do in device to device. Because you lower down your, your interference, your, your power, so you don't cause interference to others, and then you can allow a lot of those kind of peers to talk to each other, like I assume we have 25 peers here, we have 50 people here. So all these 25 device-to-device -device communication peers, they can communicate simultaneously. Instead of, if you just have one pair, they, they need to talk to the base station, they have to yell, right? If they yell, well, everybody here has to keep silent because everybody can hear that. So in that case, only one device can talk. So you can see how by doing device-to-device -device communication, we can first improve energy efficiency, second improve spectrum efficiency, Third, we can improve connectivity. We can connect all these users simultaneously into the system by doing this device-to-device -device communication. So that actually is the purpose of doing device-to-device -device communication. Of course, you know, in reality, well, we, when we do those kind of uh, design, I will use a specific example to explain, well, what kind of challenges you are dealing with. Because it sounds very promising. I can tell you that all the technologies, when you see extremely promising features, Normally, it comes with very, very challenging problems there. And you have to tackle those challenges, okay? In order to, what we say, get no pain, no gain, right? You have to tackle those great challenges in order to enable those great promising features. So this actually is the second technology we are actively researching. And the third one is called NOMA. So NOMA represents non-orthogonal multiple access. So this actually, the terminology is contrast with the traditional orthogonal multiple access. So we have OMA versus no, uh, NOMA, N-O-M-A. So NOMA actually, well, in 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, we have briefly explained what are the key modulation technologies. 
we have TDMA, we have FDMA, we have CDMA, we have OFDMA. So in these traditional technologies, we pretty much use orthogonal multiple access. What do you mean by orthogonal multiple access? It means, for example, in, I'm not sure which technology you are most familiar with, for example, in CDMA. Well, orthogonal multiple access technology really means, well, if one physical resource, this one physical resource is only assigned to one user. Versus non-orthogonal multiple access, it means one physical resource can be shared by multiple users. So let me use, for example, LTE as an example. In LTE, one physical resource could be one subcarrier. This subcarrier is one OFDM subcarrier. So this one OFDM subcarrier in LTE is one cell. It's assigned to one user. But in 5G, we allow multiple users to access to one subcarrier. Of course, you know this has been has to be done intelligently through different mechanisms. Otherwise, they will just cause interference to each other. Well, think about that. The two users access one subcarrier simultaneously. They cause well, contention or we call collision to each other, then practically the received signal is just noise. They both actually transmit at the same power. So in that case, actually, we have to design the system in intelligent way so that, well, even though the two users transmit simultaneously on the same physical resource, at the receiving side, they still can decode the signals clearly. So that's called the normal. And another technology we talk about is millimeter wave. Well, I'm not sure. What's the, uh, for example, the status of millimeter wave in terms of the regulation? Well, millimeter wave first is a part of the spectrum. So, well, why we want to go to millimeter wave? Today, our LTE, here, I don't know what's the spectrum we're using here for 3G or 4G, but I know most likely it has to be below 5 gigahertz because that's pretty much what globally the existing technologies are using below 5 gigahertz. Why? Because beyond 5 gigahertz, our technologies are not ready yet. We, are, we don't have that technology yet to have this kind of communication, I mean commercial communication. Of course we have those, I know in for example some uh, military communication, in some other communications, they have their special ways to do minimum wave communication or some other communication, but I'm talking about commercial communication like cellular network. We don't have that technology yet today to work, for example, in 100 gigahertz, not yet. But the target is, yes, the target is to make our technology work in 100 gigahertz, or 300 gigahertz, or even 300 terahertz. Well, that actually is beyond millimeter wave. You know, when we go to 300 terahertz, that's what? That's our light. This is called a visible light communication, right? Our visible light spectrum is about 300 terahertz. So that actually is also part of 5G, but that's not what we're talking about here today. Of course, you know, since I mentioned that, so I just want to give a few words about that. The visible light communication, well, people, we know that we are not settled, easily settled as just one technology. We're always trying to change ourselves to get better and better technology, higher and higher capacity. And when we were working on millimeter wave 300 gigahertz, then we already start to challenge ourselves. Why not go to 300 terahertz? If we can get capacity from 300 gigahertz, then 300 terahertz definitely will be higher. Capacity will be even higher. The higher spectrum you go, the more capacity you can have. That's just you know, physics. You can do simple physics, the calculation. Then we'll tell you. So 300 terahertz, that's our visible light spectrum. So what the idea here behind it is just leverage whatever the lighting facility for in the future. Think about this is not crazy. I know I see I visit labs, the research labs, they have those kind of communication going on already in the prototype. And they use the visible light. Of course you need to have some kind of uh, devices inside, LED specific device, which can allow both lightning and the communication. So if that occurs, Wherever you have lighting facilities, you have communication facilities. Just think about that. And then your device, well, instead of using antenna, what we need to have? LED, right? We don't need <coughs> antenna. Antenna is for radio communication. When we go to visible light, we use LED in the device. So that actually, I have seen that already in different research labs that have prototypes. So just pointing into that future, okay, so that you know what we are really, really, really working on for 5G. So let's come back to millimeter wave. Millimeter wave is still radio communication, still use today's antennas.
But the difference is, well, minimum wave, the spectrum is very high. Well, based on physics, we know that if the spectrum is high, the wavelength will be extremely small. If the wavelength is extremely small, your antenna size will be extremely small. So that gives you the capability of having a large number of antennas in a small device. Today, we don't have that capability. Okay? Because today, our antenna size, <coughs> given that device, you probably can only have four antennas. But into the future, going to the millimeter wave, your same device, you may have more than 100 antennas in one small device. Well, if you have 100 antennas, well, of course, usually we would go to 128 or 64, making this number you know, two to the order, order of two. So if you have 64 or 128 antennas in one small device, your capability of doing a well, gaining high capacity will be extremely high. Why? Because one of the capabilities you get by having this antenna is doing informing. So you can form your beam and make your communication quality much, much better. And you can actually point your communication right to your communication you know, partner without causing interference to others. So of course we'll talk about that later, okay? We, all those things, you know, they combine together will give you a very rosy picture of future 5G. But of course, you know, in order to make them work, huge challenges. That actually well, is what uh, we need to do, right? We as engineers, as technologists, as researchers, well, we actually, we like to have challenges, right? Because our job is to conquer those challenges. So by putting this together, then let's see, I have briefly introduced each technology. You can see this is pretty much what we listed here. So let's just go through those bullets quickly. So first, the normal can support more simultaneous connections, that's for sure, given this um, now of functionality, nature, and also itself is interference limited. Well, one of the problems of doing normal is interference. I can tell you, for all those technologies here, number one issue is still interference. Well, interference starting day one of building a wireless communication system. We know that, right? We are facing interference problem. And our job is, you know, from back in, I believe, the first cellular network is back in the 70s. And back in the 70s, now evolved to 2018 this year. Our number one job is to tackle the interference. How to break the interference barrier in order to get capacity high and higher. Now going to 5G, we're still dealing with that interference, okay? So normal, actually, by doing this non-orthogonal multiple access, like what I say, you have multiple users sharing the same resource. Well, number one issue, how to deal with the interference. So this dealing with the interference, of course, you know, we have various ways. But itself, actually, because of interference, normal tends to reduce the rate for each user. You have two users, three users share the same resource. Of course, each user's data rate may be reduced. But guess what? That actually, for Internet of Things type of application, this not is a big deal because Internet of Things applications compared with man-to-man -man applications, one of the key differences is man-to-man -man communications we care about through it. But internet of type of applications, of course, depending on what kind of internet applications. But a lot of IoT type of applications, what you care most is connectivity. But the data rate itself is not a big concern. Why? Just give you an example. Like we are doing metering, right? Metering for your maybe power system. And also for monitoring. Like you implement all the sensors in the museum. Try to monitor the temperature, the moisturized level in that particular you know, museum room. So what it does is it sends an environment, collect the information, and maybe every 10 minutes, 10 seconds, or every 10 minutes, or sometimes maybe even every one hour, you send a small message telling, well, if my temperature is beyond the threshold or not threshold. That's just one bit of information, yes or no, one zero. So this actually represents a very typical communication style in IoT applications. So from this communication, you can see that, well, the message size is not really big. It's very small, very small. Data rate requirement is very small. But the connectivity is huge. Why? Well, maybe you have like a, a thousand sensors deployed in one room. They need all connected to send this one big information. So you can, your concern is how to connect them, but your concern is not the capacity of each so that's why actually normal becomes a very good team candidate for IoT type of application. That actually is true. 
we are really you know, trying to implement norma in IoT type of application systems, <coughs> trying to make it work. And also device to device applications, I have said that you know, a lot. And what are the key features, advantages that make it an ideal candidate for IoT as well? And also minimum wave. Minimum wave, well, by saying that, minimum wave itself, because high spectrum, we know that at high spectrum, like 100 gigahertz, what it can happen? Well, the communication is only very short distance, very, very short distance. So only people probably in 10 meters, 20 meters can talk to each other. After that, your signal just completely fades and become noise level. So by doing that, actually, well, the good thing is, well, first, your system, I don't know if it's uh, true or not, depending on the density of the device, your system probably will become a noise-limited system instead of an interference-limited system. Okay. Why? Because the communication is just occurs in a very short distance. After that, it becomes noise level. So interference may not be a big concern in the uh, millimeter wave type of network. And then number two, for millimeter wave type of communication, it's just like your light communication. For example, if I'm talking to, I'm inside the room, the person is outside the room. For millimeter wave type of communication, this connection may not be established. Why? Because millimeter wave, given that high spectrum, it cannot penetrate. The penetration loss is extremely high. Extremely high. So that gives you, well, good things. Why? Because you retain the signals just indoor. And then you don't cause any interference to people outdoor. So it becomes a good technology for indoor communications. Same as VLC, visible light communication. So that actually, for many meter wave, this actually itself, close distance communication, small interference among each other, that makes itself actually a good candidate for IoT type of applications. So that's why today, when we say the title, we say the key technologies for 5G and IoT. Why? Because all those technologies, when we design them, we keep IoT as our you know, uh, major candidate of application to see what kind of technologies we really to develop in order to make IoT you know, success in the future. So that actually are the key technologies and we're talking about here. So now we go to, well, I hope I gave enough introduction on the motivation and the background side. Well, when we go to the detailed research, I was just focusing on just like what sometimes I talk to my postal researchers, my colleagues, my, my PhD students. When I explain a problem, I really try to focus on the methodology. If you deal with a problem like that, what you are going to do? Instead of jumping into solving a mathematical problem directly, I can tell you that most of the research ultimately will translate into a mathematical problem. That's true. You formulate the problem, it becomes a mathematical formulation, then you choose a mathematical problem to solve the problem, or to solve the formulated problem. That's true for pretty much all the research we are doing. But guess what? We are engineers, right? We are future engineers. We actually, our job is not just to solve the math problem. We really have to understand the technology. So before you formulate the problem, well, how you tie a mathematical problem into a specific engineering problem? How to understand the mathematics in the engineering way. I think that's very important as a student or researcher or well, faculty member. So whenever we do a problem like uh, in our disciplines, in order to understand you know, the engineering interpretation of a math problem, I think that actually gives us a tremendous, sometimes give us tremendous challenge, but also it is very, very important to do that. So now actually I'm focusing here today how to uh, interpret a math problem in an engineering way and also give the methodology, the general philosophy to solve a problem like that. So let's go to the, uh, and most likely I can just probably have time to explain one of the problems. But all other problems, of course the problems are completely different. But the general way to solve a problem like that is pretty much the same. Okay. So first, when we go to, for example, design a system, because I explained the technology, the first example gives you, for example, a system, a typical problem that combines the three technologies we have talked about. So how will we include or combine three technologies such as NOMA, such as Massive MIMO, and such as D2P communication into one 5G problem? That actually is what we are solving here. So first, you know, if we try to, to do research, the first step, 
Well, of course, this is always what I you know, said to when I was doing the presentation. The first step is to identify the problem, right? Well, if you really try to really, for example, write a research paper, or you, in a company, you try to propose your idea, first, you have to explain to people, what's your idea, right? What's the problem there? So identify the problem is number one. Where is the problem? So this actually is what we are doing here. So we present people the system model. We tell them, okay, this is the problem. We identify it. Then, given this problem identified, the next step is formulate the problem, right? This is the problem we have. In order to address this problem, in order to provide people, well, how to solve, uh, well, the insights of given this problem, of, of the given problem, you need to formulate the problem. Then, of course, the next step is to solve the problem, right? Given the problem, you solve it. Then, the next step is, naturally, is to evaluate the problem, right? Evaluate means, okay, I designed a very good scheme, brilliant protocol, brilliant, you know, idea. And I really try to convince, for example, the company to implement this in the product. Or try to convince, if I'm from vendor, I try to convince the operator to take my solution. What do you need to do? Present them. Okay, present them, this is how much gain I can have by using the solution compared with my competitors. So that's the part of evaluation, right? You evaluate the problem, then present your gains, your insights, or possible trade-offs to whatever the audience, this audience could be well, your, your boss, could be your competitor, could be your or could be service provider, or could be the government, right? So present them by giving them the number. Say 30%, I usually book some of my, my students present to me and they give me all those fancy things. Okay, just give me a number. Okay, what's the gain? 30%, 10%, 20%, or whatever the gain is. Or give me the curve, right? Show me where your solution is versus other existing solutions. So those are typically, ultimately, you need to present to people, okay, by having investigated all your efforts in. Step one, step two, step three, identifying, formulating, solving the problem. Ultimately, you need to present results. So those actually are typical steps when we are doing our research you know, for a problem like this. So this actually, I'm using this example to, step, to explain here. First step, identify the problem. So this is a system model. What are base station? Well, base station is, we know that, right? I see base station somewhere. You know, base station is, and these base stations, you know, transmit wireless signals out to all your devices here. So base stations here, users are scattered everywhere. So traditionally, we only have users working in the cellular mode. Cellular mode, in a sense, like, is versus device device. So cellular mode really means the users always talk to base station first. And then through base station, talk to another user. But now, we have another type of user here. We have device device users, and another type. They work on the leg. Well, what do you mean by on the leg? This is a very important concept for device to device. Device to device communication, like 50 people here form 25 device to device pairs. They talk to each other. Well, well, from wireless communication perspective, first your question is, what's the bandwidth they're using, right? When they talk, they, they need to use certain bandwidths. And I can allow all those 25 pairs to use exactly the same bandwidth. Why? Because all of them talk in a very small volume, right? Nobody calls interference to each other. If that, that's the case, it's perfectly okay to allow all those 25 peers to use the same bandwidth to talk to each other. But still the question exists, where does this bandwidth come from? Okay. So now, in the cellular communication network, what we propose here is, well, because we are really, we'll always try to make one bandwidth maximally utilized. So what we want to do is, all those 25 users, they actually use exactly the same bandwidth of one existing cellular user. Meaning, that the single bandwidth is already used by a cellular user communication from cellular user to base station, base station to user. And this bandwidth, I want that bandwidth to be reutilized by d 2 communications. So in that case, well, the simple answer is, well, traditionally, one bandwidth is only used by one user. But by using D2D pairs, if I have 25 users here, reuse that bandwidth. How many connections? 26 connections, right? Instead of one connection. That's the concept here, okay? I really want to maximize this utilization by allow a maximum number of D2D connections. First, 
they share the same bandwidth among themselves. Second, they share the same bandwidth among several resources. So that this particular physical resource is maximized, is maximally utilized. That's the concept here. Another key concept, well, today we'll talk about a lot of concepts. Okay. Another concept here is, well, communication network. Let's come back to that. We know that for several network, communication can go two ways, right? From your device to base station. From base station to the device. These are two different directions. Well, one direction is called, from device to base station is called what? Uplink, right? And from base station to a device is called downlink. And these two, di <coughs> two directions, well, I know in America, they use two different spectrum. That's called FDD. And in Uganda, I don't know, most likely it's FDD as well. I know in a lot of the Asia countries, they use TDD. But in a lot, most countries, I believe they use FDD. Same as the uh, United States. If it's using FDD, it means uplink, downlink, that's a pretty, from spectrum to spectrum, okay? One could use 20 gigahertz, oh, megahertz, today's or most likely it's megahertz, we don't have gigahertz spectrum there. So 20 megahertz here, another 20 megahertz there. They are sufficiently apart from each other, okay? So that's actually the difference between uplink and downlink. Your D2D can share uplink, can also share downlink, okay? Well, downlink, uplink is different. In okay. this case, for this particular example, we allow D2D to share downlink. Well, downlink, the problem of using downlink is obvious. I tried to use this as an example in, when I was at Kenya. Well, you are trying to use the same bandwidth, talk at the same time. It's like mosquito talk to mosquito, while elephant talk to mosquito. Your base station is like elephant, right? It's a 40 watt transmission power. Your device-to-device -device communication, when you're next to each other, probably you're using like uh, 25, 25 milliwatts or even lower. So you have a 40 watt communication versus a 25 milliwatt communication. What will happen? Well, the 40 watt communication will just totally, totally kill your 25 milliwatt communication. What does this kill mean? Interference, right? It's just over, overwhelm your DTD communication. <coughs> So in that case, actually, well, in order to realize our dream of achieving this 26 simultaneous communication, then we have to deal with this interference. Well, it's not well, interference, let me put it in this way. Interference has been there since day one, and we are smart enough, human beings are really smart, okay? Have the problem, we are not afraid of uh, having the problem, we are not, we are afraid of not having the problem. <laughs> if we can identify the problem, then I can show that. That's actually what I heard uh, from a famous professor from uh, Stanford University. I'm not sure if anybody here heard about her. She's, she's giving keynotes everywhere. Uh, professor Goldsmith, okay, she's like, uh, she has lots of textbooks, and she delivers lots of keynote speech in all the conferences. And in one of the keynote speech, because I, this is what I want to motivate the students, I, I found that's very motivating, the, her statement. She actually, she's, well, of course, she's very famous, and she has lots of great achievements. Everybody admires her. She's like Ajpuy fellow. Well, now we go back to Ajpuy. Well, Ajpuy really means if you are this level, well, you start with member, a student member, a student. Then when you become a professional, you become member, then senior member. If you really become your achievements reach a certain level, you become Ajpuy fellow. Ajpuy fellow is a great honor. Know, just uh, given to people who achieve a lot in their fields. So she's actually fellow, that's true. That's actually definitely, you know, it's not a surprise. But she's also National Academy of Engineering of the United States. That actually is a very, very great honor, very, very high honor. So she actually, given this statement, I want to share with you. She said, well, during that uh, keynote speech, everybody thinks, say to her, wow, we admire you. You're so smart. Yeah, she achieved a lot. That's what she said. She said, I don't think I'm, I'm smart as other people's. I'm probably just smart, but not super smart. Because there are so many smart, intelligent people. That's really true, I can tell that. Just from my working experience, like in my company, in my research community, in my university, even in my research group, I have seen people so smart, so intelligent. So never think yourself being the, the most smartest people. You know, we never claim that way. We see so many intelligent people. But what she said is she's very lucky. When she was doing like her research, 
she identified a good problem. And she was the first person who identified that problem. But guess what? She proposed that problem in her paper. She even did not propose the solution. But she said, in this research community, we don't lack of smart people who can solve problems. And when her paper was first published, and all those intelligent solutions were proposed based on problems she proposed. And all, all these papers gave credits to her. Why? Because she was the first person who identified the problem. They cited her paper, and they gave the credit to her, who defined the problem, and she would become very, very well recognized by the that. that actually gave us you know, very good you know, motivation, meaning, I, I don't know what's the motivation I want to share here. It really means, well, identifying the problem is important. And the second, that's what she said, being the first is important. <laughs> Be the first who found that problem. We all know the cognitive rigor concept as well, right? The, the concept was like identified in 70s or 80s by a professor. Now he's he was with he's still with Stevens Institute of Technology in the United States. He proposed the concept. I don't think he proposed any great solutions there. But today, but today everybody recognizes we call him the father of cognitive radio. Why? Because he proposed the concept. And that's what you know, Professor you know, Goldsmith said as well. Well, that's why you know you need to challenge yourself. Never try to you know think, oh, we are not smart enough to propose a idea, first idea or the idea ever. But don't be afraid of doing that. Okay. And you propose a problem, you identify a problem, and all those you know we have all the great mathematicians, great technologies, great researchers there. They can bring up great solutions to the problem, but they will give you credit. That's actually it's very. Interesting, you know, that's what I heard from what she said, and then I uh, had to remember what she, what she said. So that actually, I, I think, you know, as an engineer, as technologist, or as a researcher in the future, so that's why you need to be innovative, innovative, okay? Bring up the new ideas, and uh, people will help you with such ideas, if the idea is really good. So now, let's come back to what I'm doing here. <laughs> so I hope the story did not you know, divert you too much, because that, those are all related. <coughs> so here, since we allow DVD several users, and to make it further, we want to have massive antennas and base stations. And since they have massive antennas, one of the jobs that massive <coughs> antenna can do is what? Form narrow beams, right? That actually is being forming. And if I say, give you a simple example, if I have a base station, which has 128 antennas. And uh, I can talk to 100, maximally, I can talk to 128 users simultaneously if each user's device has only one antenna. Okay. So that actually means in one physical resource, I form 128 beams, narrow beams. Each beam point to one user. And all those 120 users can talk simultaneously. Why? Because they all talk in that small beam. That small being are separate from others. So there's no interference among each other. That's just a simple way to understand beam forming. Of course, you know, how to form these small beings, narrow beings, we have this, you know, advanced signal processing technologies in, over the ear to process the messages you are transmitting so that over the ear they're separate, okay, into each beings. So this actually is what we are doing here. So you have large number of antennas, you form beings, but we make the problem even challenging because traditionally in each beam you have one user, right? And you, because you don't want to have interference. But now given NOMA, in each beam, we have multiple users. Because this multiple user can non-orthogonally, non-orthogonal really means what? They're not separated, right? Orthogonal means they're separated. Non-orthogonal means they're all just lumped together. And over the year, the signals just try to keep each other. And the receiver, instead of receiving one signal, I am the same physical resource in the same cell, in the same being, at the same time slot, I receive 10 signals. Wow, if I receive 10 signals, all those 10 signals are useful signals because they are from 10 users. And it's not like traditionally only one user is useful signal, other nine users are, nine signals are interference, right? Then what I need to do is I just decode one signal, ignore the interference. But if I receive 10 signals, all 10 signals in normal case, they are user information. Then I need to decode all of them. Okay, they are lumped together. So what we can do here, you know, in NOMA, well, the key technology in NOMA is what? I'm not sure if you have, you have ever heard about it. It's called successive interference calculation. Well, one of the key technologies to that. What do you mean by successive interference calculation? If I receive 10 users, right? I rank them, I order them, well, in a certain way. 
so that from signal processing perspective, I can decode 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 successively. And get all this 10 user signal decoding. And that's actually what you know, the key technology. So when I put all of them together, well, I explain the problem. Well, the problem here, first interference. Second, what kind of beamform schemes? What kind of B2D communication schemes? What kind of normal schemes I really need to use to combine all of them together? So that this system, what's my goal? My goal is to get the maximum throughput. Okay, maximum throughput of it. So now, I explain to people the problem. Well, I, I can tell you that my students are very smart. They just go to formulate the problem quickly. Well, what kind of problem? Normally, we can formulate the problem. We can know that in a typical system design, we can formulate the problem such as a game problem, right? Game theory. Because we know each other. Everybody is greedy, I can tell you that, in the system. If I have a mini user in my system, a thousand user in my system, I can tell you that each user's goal is to maximize their own benefit. But guess what? From system perspective, system has its own goal to maximize the system problem, right? So system users, all of them have different goals. And this goes conflict sometimes. And then typically we can formulate a game problem. Or we can formulate optimization problem. You just simply formulate your objective. Then formulate the optimization problem and let all users' systems' goals to form the constraints. Okay. So you have lots of constraints in the system from solve the optimization problem. Or sometimes we formulate the problem as a stochastic problem. Well, we have to realize that a communication system is a stochastic system. It's not a fixed system. Stochastic in what sense? Stochastic in the sense, right, at this time, I have 50 users in this room. Next moment, of course, you know, we have a scheduled meeting here. But assume it's just a dynamic environment, like shopping mall. Think about shopping mall, the number of users you know, in the shopping mall. It is a stochastic process. And the thing about, you know, it's just an like entire city here. How many users, you know, residential area versus commercial uh, area, how those users, the volume changes, traffic rate changes. This is all dynamic, stochastic. So the communication system by its nature is a stochastic system. So that's why, you know, I just try to see typically what kind of uh, formulate the problem you may see. Game problem, optimization problem, stochastic problem, or some others like queuing problem, or some others we have like, for example, like routing. In routing, we have a graph problem, like a graph theory problem. So we have lots of different problems that can be formulated. But in our system, I will just skip all those math part. In our system, how can I move down? Let me see. I see the page there goes down, but then this doesn't go down. That's no problem. It's okay. I can just rephrase it. So by doing all those, you know, schemes, definitions, form, form, uh, finally we formulate this optimization problem. I just showed the problem we formulated. Well, if we formulate the problem, uh, we have advanced a lot already. I'm, you know, usually when, if my students, they come to me with a formulated problem like this, I'm happy, wow, say your 50% job is already done. Why? Because you definitely have something in your mind so that you can formulate the problem like that. You understand what's your system model. You understand, okay, what kind of technology you're trying to target at. And then you try to understand what's the objective you try to achieve. Then you can see a problem like that. Of course, you know, the next step is when, whenever I see a problem like that, you no, know, all kinds of problems, optimization, game, stochastic, then of course the next step is, okay, please solve the problem. Okay, solve the problem by practicing your math. Okay, so math is important as an engineer. That's true. It is important. So solve the problem, then we see the solution. So finally, when we solve the problem, okay, we see the closed form solution. I can tell you that most likely, for most of the research problem, we don't have to close form. Closed form is extremely challenging to get, but for this particular problem, we don't have closed form. So closed form really means your solution is on the right side. Left side is what you want to solve as a variable. Wow, if you see that, that's great, brilliant. Uh, see the solution like that. So when we see a solution like that, oh, well, your next step is you solve the problem, then you're going to evaluate the problem. You evaluate the problem, you present curves to people, you present your numbers, your percentage, your relative, again, your curves relative to others. 
So those are what we know ultimately green simulation. Green simulation means, well, in your software, MATLAB for example. MATLAB has been one of the most useful simulation tools we are using. Well, we have lots of other tools. Some people just write C code. So basically, in your software, you write your system in the software, okay? You implement your system, your base station, your users, your channel, your scheme D2D &D norma. You translate that into software. And using your software to emulate a real system. So then you produce the curves from your software. So this is actually what we present to, curve, to the users. Well, number one, when you present the curves, first, if I, the person who sees the curve, the natural question, the first question you need to ask is, Please tell me, how do, why should I believe your curves generated from simulation are accurate, right? You can't make, make well, we know that, when you write code, you can make mistake. So number one, when you're producing the curves, well, show people what the accuracy of your curve, okay? Accuracy. So you have to demonstrate your curves are accurate. Well, I will not tell you exactly through what way, because the various different evaluation methodologies work different ways. But the key part is, you need to present people, you need to convince people, right? It's your job. Convince people. Look, those are the curves I present. I have my way to convince you those curves are accurate. So we have lots of different ways to do that. Sometimes by comparing with other schemes, sometimes you build up a benchmark system to show, this is my benchmark system, everybody knows the code should be here. And this is the curve I generated, only 1% difference, okay? Close enough to what people really do. So this actually is usually what we do, okay? You show this curve, this is where it should be, and this is what I get from my simulation. They are almost the same with each other. Then you are doing job. Of course, you know, by convincing people what you are doing is right. Well, that's important, right? If you're doing totally wrong things, then don't just go to the next step. Still focusing on the first step. That's called verification. So you verify what you are doing, then go to the next step, showing your insights, sharing your insights from your design. So here, actually, I'm just using the example. For example, what we are showing here is, well, we try to show people using norma definitely is better without knowing using norma. Even though there's a huge interference there, even though there's a huge challenge there, but it shows good capacity again. Okay, number one, shows good connectivity there. And then number three, we try to demonstrate to people by allowing B2B coexisting with the elephant base station. Well, you still allow D2D to achieve good performance again by doing what? Well, we're doing signal processing <coughs> at the base station to tweak the base station signal away from D2D signals. That actually is totally achievable. Okay? If you don't do that, well, you have to do something else to protect D2D users. If you direct allow base station signal hit your device device communication, I can tell in the downlink, I can tell you that your device device never works. Never works. Think about that. You use 25 milliwatts to compete against a 40 min, 40 watt communication uh, device. There, there's no way that your device to device communication can work. Okay? So you have to do something to protect your small power communication. That's always true. So that's actually uh, what we want to share here. I think those problems actually from research perspective, methodology perspective, or philosophy perspective, I think they're all the same. You first go to identify your problem, then formulate the problem, solve the problem, and share the insights. But just like each of the problem is formulated differently. So I think I probably want to go to my last problem. Because the second problem, well, I just try to explain what the second problem idea. The second problem is to allow D2D to uplink. First is downlink, right? The second problem is just to show you what's the challenge we're dealing with in the uplink. Because uplink and downlink is completely different. Downlink, you're competing with the base station. Uplink, what you're competing with. Your, your device to device communication actually is competing with another device. It's not competing with the base station anymore. So your problem becomes the opposite problem. The darling problem is you're concerned that your device to device communication will get huge interference of base station. But the uplink your concern really becomes your device to device communication can cause big interference to, to several issues actually. So that actually flips the problem. Then we try to show you how you deal with the problem. The, the other direction, um, how you identify a legitimate technology problem, how you formulate that problem, and how to solve that problem. So this actually is the second uh, problem. And I just want to say a few things about last one. Last one is about millimeter wave. Millimeter wave, I have explained the challenges. I can tell you that 
I have to touch another big challenge of mini middle wave. Mini middle wave, well, cannot penetrate. That's okay, you stay in the indoor. But the problem of mini middle wave is any small tight object in the room can block the signal. It means, well, one moment I can talk to you. If I try just switch my position slightly, then your connection is blocked. That's called you know, shadowing or blockage problem in mini middle wave. If you don't solve the problem, mini middle wave will not work. So that actually is a key challenge. What we are doing here is, okay, we allow relays to be deployed to help to establish this line of sight communication, to help me the way. That's what we're doing here. So we try to deploy relays strategically in various positions so that if the connection between two users are blocked by certain things, then we'll make sure that your device to the relay can still talk so that you, know, you can build up this multi-hop communication to help relays. So that actually is what we do in this research. But of course, you know, by helping, uh, or by using relays to help, uh, the mini middle wave actually can establish communication very, very efficiently. Even like, for example, in the geographic area, if I have a thousand devices, you only probably strategically need, to say, five relays. Don't use large number of relays, but put them in a good location. So this is actually is what we show here. We use the mathematical analysis to demonstrate that. A small number of relays in a good locations can help in a the way of tremendous effect. So if you use five, your performance gain, for example, is 50%. If you increase this five to 10, your performance probably just give you five extra gain. So meaning only a small number of relays will be sufficient, but they need to be good, located, well located. <coughs> of course, you say if you double your 50 to, or double your relay from five to 10, or increase from 10 even to 100, you wouldn't see the corresponding performance gain from say 50% to 500% definitely. Okay. You probably see the performance gain from 50% to 70%, but guess what? The question is, uh, do you really want to get this extra 20% by increasing your relay from 5 to 100? That's the question you need to ask. I think you know from communication system design perspective, you always you know, not just performance is the king, right? Cost definitely is especially when you go to deployment and uh, if you go to service provider, they will care about cost a lot, besides the cost. Of course, from purely uh, design or research perspective, we care about performance a lot, but that's what we are saying. We are engineers, right? We are doing real system deployment. Think about, you know, when you go to a real system design, as an engineer, what you really can do, not just, you know, from, think about from pure, research perspective. I think that actually can conclude my talk today. I just give you three different, so of course if you are really interested into the detailed research, because now you need to go to the real map to show all those durations, to show people, say by deploying five relays, by deploying ten relays, what's the blockage percentage, what's the connectivity percentage, what's the throughput percentage increase. So you can do that all through the you know, analysis. So that actually concludes my talk today in terms of 5G and uh, so we, we jump into conclusions here. Of course, you know, conclusions are consistent with motivations I have explained in the first slide, right? We conclude that normal can tremendously improve connectivity capacity. D2D can greatly bring up your connectivity as well as reducing your energy consumption. And the mini wave, of course, you know, by itself, just itself, if, if it works, it means capacity, we know that, right? From 5 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz, you can see how much capacity, how much bandwidth we can get from the mini wave. So that actually gives us a, a good conclusion here. So I'll stop here and wait for questions if you have any. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rose, and um, for the interest of the people that came in a bit late. Uh, we would have to rush because we wanted her to continue to have a, a good experience in Uganda and she has a flight to catch early afternoon. So as I had uh, requested earlier, if you have questions, write them down. We are going to take some questions now, but uh, at 11 we shall make a hard cut. Um, so, but if you've written them down, then you can get them. So, but I want to first start, since I have the floor, uh, by thanking Professor Rose so much. And I'm so thankful that I have a number of my students in here because I'm always asking them, they, you know, they call me Miss Value Add. I'm always asking them, 
So what about your problem? Because our students, they want to rush into the solution and show you how great the solution is. But you see, I need to first understand what problem are we talking about, okay? Who cares about the problem, okay? And uh, the thing I've loved most about your presentation, apart from, of course, the technical thing, is how difficult it is to understand what the problem is, okay? And I think what you say is what I told the first year. Once you know what the problem is, the rest is math. And engineers or people who are, you know, the engineering side of things, we like math. So once you know what the problem is, to do the math is, okay, yeah, the equations didn't look very friendly. But at least once you are there, you don't want to. Okay? But the harder part is figuring out how are you actually going to represent the problem. Okay? That's actually the bigger part in what we need to do. Once you're on the math side, you're now starting the solution. Okay? So if everyone takes nothing away from this, I hope you will appreciate that don't jump into the deep end and start solving things and say this is, you see, it will look nice like this. No, no, no. Let's first understand what are we dealing with. Alright, so let me open up uh, for questions. And I apologize, and I said this earlier, people who are shielded by the, the pillars, I, I'm sorry about that. Okay, one. Alright. Any other questions? Okay, we'll start with you. Uh, one and then two. Thanks very much. It's a brilliant presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, just um, you really focused on the D2D, which I can understand because uh, that's the that's the big problem going forward. Um, for communications, for regular phone communications, I'd say for voice and, and other data, um, what modulation scheme do you see happening between the base station and and the mobile device? And can the D2D communication, let's say, between two devices, somehow that multi, uh, millimeter wave be used for regular voice and and data communications as well, or and is there some dynamic way of going back to the, the old way, should there be a pillar in the way or whatever, while you're doing your communication or whatever? I think D2D, yeah, I think if, if you say, okay, for some cellular, traditional phone communications, they can carry uh, this voice communication, video communication, I think all those communications, I don't see there's any problem that you can do use D2D communications or millimeter wave communications. But of course, you know, when we say present, say when we support those different applications, uh, you, you, you also want to achieve the cross bounding quality of service. That actually is what you really concern when you go to the real application, because different applications, they have different quality of service requirement. Especially, for example, if I use the uh, divide, uh, millimeter wave as an example, because millimeter wave connectivity is really unstable. So if you still try to, for example, support mission critical, like we call mission critical delay, very delay sensitive application. We know that this actually is, represents one typical application in 5G. So the latency can go down to one millisecond. So if you want to support those type of applications, I don't see minimum wave is a problem, but there is a challenge. Because you really want to make sure your connect, connection is stable. So in order to make sure, so you have a problem in front of you. Say, okay, given this you know, blockage issue, given this you know, the connectivity stability issue, what if you know, I want to support, you know, for example, those mission critical applications through minimum wave, what can we do? So at, at today, actually, my research group, we have students that are dealing with this problem. We try to make sure you set up connections. For example, one of the typical uh, solutions people are proposing is, okay, how about you know, set up multiple connections, multiple connections simultaneously. So if one connection gets blocked, you, you hope like if you have three connectivities set up through different directions, if a con one connectivity gets blocked, you still have two other connectivity going on. So you have like, I'm just giving you one example. This can also occur in other applications. And uh, these days actually, especially in 5G, we change the network technology tremendously. We change the idea of traditional, for example, it's network center design, we move more towards like user center design. You center around the user to build up a more reliable user oriented network. So that you know this network is becoming very reliable for the user, uh, even though you are, for example, you are moving in a very high speed, you are still having a good connection because we know that even traditional networks is problem, right? If you are even moving in a very high speed, driving your network, you can get this connection drop easily. But how about, for example, in the future? Because the problem becomes even worse in the future. In the future, we know that the network becomes what we call the ultra dense small network. Small network is what? Traditional my network size, one cell is this big. But in 5G, it becomes this small. If, if my cell becomes this small, 
and not talking about driving, if, even though like you are running, then you can get into those kind of connection problems. So we change the network infrastructure, you know, topology tremendously to make sure you know this kind of communication centered around the user and to make it more reliable. Thank you. Because as we move into the future, previously all the requirements were network centered, but more than towards the user centered requirements, like what are reliable, high reliability, and of course all these are going to affect the, how you design the network. So I was wondering whether some of these like normal because that part of processing and everything, mm -hmm. how do they factor in the reliability, mm -hmm. the type of reliability, mm -hmm. and the latency, because if it is doing a lot of processing, <coughs> the latency goes to shooting up. Um, so that balance between that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see, I, I, don't, um, I, I try to understand your problem. <coughs> For example, you're using normal as example. So using normal, you say, likely, you may give you a high latency, for example, because your signal processing time could be higher. And But keep that in your mind, okay, signal processing delay from communication perspective is not the biggest delay. Biggest delay normally occurs from, say, <coughs> over-the-air communication or propagation. So communication, because why communication delay these days is not like a big concern, because today we have the advanced chip technology. We know that the most role, right? We have this MOS role, and which actually enables the fast compu computation. The computation speed doubles every how many years? So we have this, you know, chip technology, which actually gives you a very, very powerful computing capability to shorten your signal processing delay. So signal processing delay, it is yes, it contributes, but it is not the biggest part of, of communication. But on the other hand, NOMA can shorten the connection time. Think about that, you know, if traditionally if I use orthogonal multiple access, two users they want to access, one user access, another user. You have to wait two times also, two physical resources. But now I can pack them into one resource. So at each time slot, the user can access. So from that perspective, actually your access delay is greatly reduced. That actually gives you, that's actually over the year delay. That delay, like today, is 20 milliseconds. Computation delay, well, if you have very comp powerful computing like this NOMA, it can solve very fast, less than one millisecond. Very fast. So that actually, the scale is different. So if you can greatly reduce the over-the-air over the access delay as well as propagation delay, that actually, the scale reduction is much, much higher. It gives you much better advantage. Okay. Did I see it? In the research level, what's the difference between uh, the wireless lab and D2D? Uh, from wireless wireless LAN for IGN. Oh, wireless LAN, uh, I think that's a good question, yeah. I think, I think I'm glad you bring this up because, yes, from communication, just the mode itself, it looks very similar. They look very similar because Wi Fi, wireless LAN also allow us to talk to each other directly, and uh, that's called ad hoc mode. We know that Wi Fi has two modes infrastructure mode, ad hoc mode. In ad hoc mode, you do allow devices to talk to each other directly. And the D2D actually also allows users to talk to each other directly. But the key difference between the two is one is licensed band and one is unlicensed band. D2D, we, we propose D2D under cellular mode, or under cellular network. That's licensed band. And the Wi Fi, a wireless LAN is an unlicensed band. So if uh, that actually by itself gives you a big difference. We know li the difference between license band and unlicensed band, a huge difference there. One is your private yard and one is public yard, right? From access perspective, and you know, license band gives you much, much better guarantee than unlicensed band. And also, you know, the, another difference is D2D, even though itself, uh, communication, data communication occurs between two users, but the control is still anchored. You have to have something anchored in the base station. Why? Because you are using licensed band. And the base station has to know that. Somebody using my band, and somebody, somebody access my bandwidth. I mean, for example, from quality perspective, from billing perspective, from all these perspectives, your control has to be aware by the base station. So your control plan actually is anchored at the base station. And the, the only data path, data plan, is bypassing the base station. Quick follow one question from that. Do you see the fact that you have D to D and therefore you're not your really your spectral efficiency has improved, are uh, resulting into lower licensing fees? 
My unit price goes down because the, from a uh, service operator perspective, uh, their revenue goes down. Mm -hmm. So that so benefit will accrue to the yeah, operator. Yeah, and, that is, the and then they can get more money, and the meaning the percentage of their total revenue going to the license fee is great reduced. Mm -hmm. That actually, I can see. But I don't see their absolute license fee going down. And I, I think the only trend I can see probably is going up instead of going up, going down. <laughs> so is there a millimeter wave? Frequency going to have to be a license now as well. Yeah, it is. Yes. No, in mini mini wave you also have licenses versus unlicensed. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but cellular network you always. Well, today we also have unlicensed LTE. That's that's true. But if you are using the license band, you still have to pay. That's that's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah, but typically, the millimeter wave is very cheap <coughs> currently compared to you know. You mean? The, I think definitely the unit price definitely is. is Cheaper, because yeah. the lower spectrum you go, the more expensive. Because yeah. that spectrum is very small, right? Mm -hmm. And then everybody wants to use that spectrum. Why? Th that's the favorable spectrum. Good propagation mm -hmm. and good penetration, mm -hmm. and uh, from hardware perspective, less challenging than your ADDA amplifier. Everything. You know that's why all the existing technology are crowded. You know, squeezed into those spectrum. And the future, you know, maybe the way they present lots of uh, big challenges. But per unit price, definitely, I should, should be much lower. Because people encourage you to go there. Yeah. I think that, the, that that's the key part. They encourage you to go there. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Jordi. We made a presentation on uh, no, and, and other technologies. Uh, with challenges in uh, security in most of the IoT, uh, what would be the security and that protection for normal uh, D2D uh, massive MIMO? And uh, the MN wave? Uh, security issues, a lot of security mechanisms have been proposed to protect, you know, for example, wireless communication. And I don't see, for example, mini mini wave, I don't see it has a higher risk of being, for example, of subjecting to security problem than lower spectrum. Actually, in mini mini wave, people claim security problem is less. Why? Because it progress less distance, right? It's confined indoor. And people, it's difficult for people to hijack into the signal. I mean, from a propagation perspective. So I don't see mini wave itself presents a high risk of a security problem. But D2D itself can be, because E2D, you know, you, you, you bypass the base station, you establish connection, so you, you present probably more like authentication problem than you know, device to uh, communication problem. But that's part of, I would say, typical authentication process that have been addressed today in several networks already. And the NOMA, I think NOMA itself, the technology itself, I don't think it's more uh, subject to risk problem. But in general, the problem, the wireless problem still applies to NOMA. Yes. It itself, so that's why the existing wireless security uh, schemes, technologies, they should apply to D2D, they should apply to NOMA, also should be applied to, uh, I think, many of the world as well. But again, I'm not a, my major research is not security. So if you have, a, because my major research is more on communication and networking side, I truly believe if you have a security person here, they may tell you a different story from their perspective. But I'm talking about communication networking perspective. I don't see like a very different problem, for example, that triggers a security concern. But it's general security concerns in wireless state security uh, challenges. And so there's also a lot of work in that space, first of all, to dispel the fear or to really understand what is the, the risk uh, in that space and what more work uh, lies, around, uh, lies around that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Three was the case. Yeah. Okay, as you report in this 5G network, will it be a, 
So there's a lot of uh, concern in that area. So if we're moving to 5G and the frequencies mm -hmm. we need for that, and you know the dynamics are right. having more intense D2D communication. So that means uh, probably more EMF around you. Mm -hmm. Is that something to be concerned about or not? So I'll do one question at a time. Sure. Yeah. So that's the first question, right? Okay. Yeah, that's my understanding of the first question as well. I think in general, when we go to 5G, because our goal, for example, one of the typical goals in 5G, we really want to reduce the power as energy efficiency is one of our goals. So D2D, if you talk about D2D, for example, D2D itself helps you to reduce the device transmission power. So from, for example, if you want to talk to base station, you have to use, say, 200 milliwatts. But when you use D2D mode, you only use 20 milliwatts. So that itself actually brings down the radiation. And also, the infrastructure side, but because traditionally we're concerned of this big base station, nobody wants to build your house next to a big base station, that's for sure. Even though there's no study showing clearly, say, it's true that this big space station uh, cause health issue. But as a general you know, concern human being, they don't want to build a house next to a power base station. But in, in 5G, for example, we, we reduced, one of the goal of 5G is to reduce these big base stations by replacing the small base stations. That's why we say ultra-dense, small network. So we try to get this small cell everywhere, and this big cell, probably the number of big cells will, will be tremendously reduced. So that actually helps to reduce the environmental, you know, the, the green gas emission and also help to reduce the radiation. Because this big base station, if you're really concerned about radiation, the big base station could be a concern. So by reducing the number of big base stations, I believe the radiation will be reduced. By reducing the transmission power of your device, the radiation will be also reduced. And also one of the belief, but I'm not saying that this is a say mature research yet, but one of the belief what you know in, in people's research is by using millimeter wave, because millimeter wave has very, very poor penetration. So if you use millimeter wave, for some if your device uses millimeter wave, that's what people believe. Some people say, well, if you go to a spectrum like 100 gigahertz, well, when you hear from 3 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz, the immediate reaction is what's the radiation? Right? Because your, your frequency is that high, your radiation could be even higher. But the problem is that people, you know, they, they already show that in a paper saying because the penetration of millimeter wave is so, so poor. And uh, even like, for example, a range of, you know, a range of can block a millimeter wave communication. So the person behind you, if it's a millimeter wave, doesn't work because the signal cannot penetrate you. And, but in LTE, yes, they can establish the signal. And you are living in the IP world, right? You have IP signal anywhere. I mean, this penetration happens every day. It will not cause a problem, right? If it causes a problem, the problem is already there. No, so don't be scared by this word. Because I've been using just a theoretical word, a research word, doesn't mean, I mean, from, it's not a word in the, how to say, the health word or medical word. Penetration means something else, you know. So. I'm just literally comparing with you know low spectrum and high spectrum. So meaning yes, in, that's why we're talking about say if you're inside the room, if you are moving, one moment you can communicate, next moment you cannot. Why? Because people may move just behind an obstacle, or people just move after another person, then your communication just stops there. It just does not penetrate. I believe you know uh, this kind of radiation issues for wireless communication. The research is still ongoing. Yeah, the test is still ongoing. It's not the same we stop here today and claim zero. But everything I've heard is people say we believe, we think, but nobody say we have proved it is zero. So well that's actually what's the fact. Right now. 
I think thank you for your response to that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we're walking in the waves and everything. I don't know how many of you know Professor Lugujo, uh, who's the VC at Indeje, but he had a very nice way of describing uh, the fact that, you know, the waves are all about us and we are part and parcel of what's yeah, happening in that it's process. Just here, so, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, so, and I think perhaps our job as people who understand a little bit more with that is uh, to help dispel the fear the room has about it. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, oh yes, you had another oh, question. So, um, and the way I understood it was that, okay, the traditional scheme of things, we have a frequency allocation of TV, or this spectrum for, you know, communication, the spectrum for TV, and things like that. So, um, any chances as we migrate to 5G and convergence that we may have any issues with one sector interfering to the others? I'm not even sure we'll be able to distinguish one sector from that. I mean, like, this is TV, this is... Uh, communication anymore, but I don't know if that's a question you ask. Yeah. You mean in 5G, you, you may not differentiate between okay. one segment yeah. from another yeah. segment? Yeah, because of that traditional one, you know that, okay, from here to here, uh -huh. this is telecom. Uh -huh. okay, from here to here, this is TV. Uh -huh. From here to here, this is air navigation service. Well, that's, yeah, that's part yeah. of the uh, spectrum allocation, right? Yes, yes. But in 5G, yes, we will have the same spectrum allocation. Spectrum allocation is always, always there. That's why, you know, the, the, the first topic we have addressed is like FCC or UCC here. They're responsible for allocating the spectrum. The, 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 the key answer, I would say the answer here is when the folks on UCC is doing this spectrum allocation, they're not going to allocate the same spectrum to TV and uh, commercial cellular application. You, you won't do that. Mm -hmm. But I can, I can tell you that in 5G, it's not just in 5G, in 4G, 3G, probably the same. Because one of the concepts is cognitive rating we talk about, right? You do allow people to access other people's spectrum for the white space, right? Mm -hmm. So if the spectrum is available there, and you do those kind of spectrum sensing, and you access, you know, this unused spectrum to get to the maximum utilization of the spectrum. That, you know, the technology there is not just 5G, 4G, similarly, you have this technology there. So I don't see 5G will fundamentally change that fact. But 5G, maybe the technology there will be more mature to allow you to do those kind of sharing. But if you do this kind of sharing, keep that in your mind. You always have the primary holder, primary user. That are the users who host the spectrum. And you have secondary user who just do the best effort, right? Because access without, if the spectrum is detected, unused. And if the primary user comes back, then they will retreat to surrender the spectrum back to the primary users. That actually is not new. That's the cognitive radio concept. And do you see that uh, 5G and 5G and beyond uh, increases acceptability of cognitive radio and it increases acceptability for secondary users and the quality of service they get? Do you see? I, I don't know if they actually uh, increase the accessibility or improve the accessibility. But what I can see here is in 5G itself, the technology itself, or actually. Just, you know, among primary users, they will actually make the spectrum, I believe, very much busy already. Mm -hmm. They have the technology to do that. Okay. It's not like they leave a big white space hole there, which is now used. Because 5G do have the technology to actually try to detect these uh, white holes, try to have all kinds of applications, devices. Think about IoT devices mm -hmm. and all those tremendous number of different segments we are having today. We have all, lots of verticals that coexist in the same <coughs> They are now coexisting. <coughs> Traditional cell network is pretty much only supporting you know, commercial type of uh, users, right? Voice application, video applications. But in 5G, we have lots of verticals. We have health segment, we have vehicle, vehicle communication segment, we have uh, smart grid segment, we have, uh, like today's, uh, for example, user, voice, video. So they are all coexisting. If they have those different you know, segments, verticals, they coexist. I truly believe, you know, with their application, with their traffic volume, with their number of users, they will pretty much make you a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So that means actually the cognitive radio will help the primary user mm -hmm. make the most of what they have. It helps them. Yeah, the factory yeah. technologies will yeah. make the primary user. But cognitive <coughs> definitely, I think I still think cognitive radio is the technology itself is there. It's really, I would say, it's a business model. Say, if I'm a service provider, am I willing to, right? How kind of business model I'm going to accept to allow a secondary user to access my spectrum? So I think this is more or less a business model. I don't think it's a technology issue. Because cognitive technology has been there all the time.
I know here that these are some of the discussions we've been having more on the policy side of it. And yeah, it's not policy, business, yeah, it's not really a technology issue. I don't think it's a technology issue. All right, I see one and two. Yeah, I think we should have Oh, okay. Please remember your number, okay? So one, two, three, four, five. And I think when we reach five, we probably might be out of time. Okay, so but please remember your number. One. I think we started here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, you talked about um, this spectrum efficiency and then we have now 5G. Uh, but uh, when we use the visible light spectrum, there the bandwidth is allowed. And the, this research on uh, visible light spectrum and communication has been on the way for some time. But up to now, there is no deployment. There is no commercial deployment. As you said earlier, we are hoping that um, the prototypes are still in the, in the labs, in the research labs. I want to understand uh, what is playing the deployment uh, in that area. What's the deployment in that area? Uh, what is playing that deployment? What's their deployment? Yeah, why is the deployment? Well, there? why is the deployment? Why? Yeah. Uh, so why or when? Why? 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 Yes. Well, why? Well, I think it's a two whys. When they have <coughs> tremendous bandwidth, right? People always want a high bandwidth. You have tremendous bandwidth in the LC. Tremendous. Yes. Because it's a terahertz. Terahertz, you know, spectrum. Wow. If you if you say in terabyte spectrum, you can easily get 100 gigahertz bandwidth. Think about today we have 3.5 gigahertz LT, you can only get 20 megahertz. But if you go through 300 terahertz, you can get 100 gigahertz bandwidth. And uh, so the bandwidth is tremendous. That actually is the key motivation for going to VLC. Second motivation is cost. Deployment, easy of uh, deployment and uh, low cost. Why? You just reuse the current, uh, any existing uh, lighting infrastructure. Because lighting infrastructure, anyway, you have to have that, right? Highway, roadside, the room, auditorium, shopping mall. So whenever you have this high lighting facility, you have uh, the communication facility. Today they're separate, right? I have lighting facility. If I want to have a communication facility, I have to deploy base station. I have to have uh, you know all those communication infrastructures. But if you use VLC, deployment it itself is part of the lighting facilities. So you don't have the second deployment. They're all together. And the cost is, is low. And the easy of deployment is lower. Because the building the lighting facility, I believe people probably are more experienced than building a base station. Excuse so, mm -hmm. I think he wanted to know why they haven't gone to the market. Why? Why haven't the 5G staff gone to the market? Why is it still in the lab? Oh, why? Oh, expect? that's because it's still research stage. Yes, that's what you wanted to Oh, know. why? Oh, I see. No, no, the VLC, why is it, why has it taken so long in the, in the labs? No, it's not why it's taking so long, because research just started. Because it just happened later that people realize that, okay, we want to use the light spectrum for commercial communication, and let's start a research project. It's, it's just like millimeter wave. You will say, oh, why millimeter wave? It's not commercially used, used it yet because the research just started. Research just started five years ago. It takes certain time, but the technology can come mature. Then VLC, the same thing, because VLC traditionally, visible light is just used for lighting. People don't use that for communication. Then realize VLC can be used, VLC itself is a spectrum, right? Then people realize that, oh yeah, it can be used for communication as well, theoretically. Then let's see how to make that work. So the technology itself is not mature yet. It's not mature. And I think that's very motivating because it means that, and this is what I really believe, mm -hmm. that we can come up with new technologies even. Here we know our circumstances, we know our propagation characteristics, we know our willingness to pay and all that. So what are the kind of problems that we can come up with and then really come up with solutions? And then who knows, some of these solutions may cross across uh, the, the border. So, for example, like mobile money and all this, these are things which came from our local, let me say East African, since you're doing an East African tour, from our local East African context, but now it's, you know, it's big news all over the, all over the place. Okay, number two. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I think my first question is, uh, when this is eventually rolled out, what is going to be the distance between this theoretical, uh, let me say, the base stations. How far apart are the base stations going to be? And when, what, 
and, and now, uh, for instance, yes, that's the first question. How far are these base stations going to be apart? And secondly, when the base stations are theoretically very close together, what are the challenges and visits challenges in terms of uh, managing hand of you know, mobility management? How is it being addressed right now? Thank you. Uh, right now, actually, no. I, I think yes, uh, because five G, uh, the foundation of building five G, one of the architecture is called heterogeneous network. So in heterogeneous network, you basically can be very close to each other. It's not just one type of base station. You have big base stations, small base stations, very small base stations, tiny base stations. You have all those different types of base stations. Big base stations is like today's big base station. They are far apart. It could be like two kilometers, uh, kilometers uh, apart. Or it could be one kilometer apart. Or in a dense deployment, in a, in a urban, very urban environment, it could be 500 meters apart. But the small base stations, your distance could be, say, 50 meters apart. It's very possible. Or in some other scenarios, you, you, you can deploy the small network you want. If you really want to extremely dense, extremely small, it could be 10 meters apart. That actually is possible. It's very possible, depending on what's the scale of your base station. You can choose a very, very small base station, very, very small base station, which only 10 meters apart. That's, that's, that's possible. But that something gives you the handle problem. That's true. Handle problem is a key problem in 5G, in heterogeneous network. And we have uh, different solutions to address handover problem. And one handover problem actually is what we are uh, saying. I'm not sure if I put the dual connectivity. Because handover, if you understand how handover works, handover, 90% of the job is in control plan. Only 10% is doing the contact switching, the database switching. So if that's happening, then what people think of in naturally is, well, in the heterogeneous network, anchor your control plan in big base station. Only using small base stations for your data transitions. So it really means if you move between small base stations, because your concern only occurs between small base stations, right? Big base stations like today's handover. So if you anchor your data control in the big base station, your handover problem is pretty much the same as today's handover. You, you, if you move from small base stations, your 90% of handover will not occur. You just do contact switching for data. But if you do contact switching for data, that's what we call data central network, the concept I just mentioned. If you form the surrounding each user to allow, say, nearby, I have five small base stations. I'm just using an example. Five small base stations nearby me. I center this user. I allow this five small base stations form collaborative, cooperative communication. So if the five stations form cooperative communication, they form a small cluster. If you move, you can see, you may drop one user at one time, but you are not going to drop five users simultaneously. So your data connection will, will not lose. So it will give you sufficient time to reform the cooperative cluster. Okay, just, just, just to get a little bit more uh, um, insight into this, um, in terms of handover, let's be assume that, as you mentioned, that the distance apart among the micro stations is around 50 meters. And uh, you have, let's say, this, you have put the stations 50 meters apart along a road, and I'm driving at 100 kilometers per hour along the road. I was talking to my wife at home, and I'm driving. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying, yes. But you, if I put uh, a question on this, I think the, the key thing here, and uh, again, it's because my students are here now, sorry um, for you, abusing my platform, oh. <laughs> I think that's the advantage of heterogeneous networking. Okay, because then that lets you know at what different layers we are operating at. Okay, are we dealing at a macro layer or are we dealing at a people layer? And then that, that solves itself at that level. But of course, the handover problem remains, but as you say, there are a number of solutions for that. But for me, in fact, I was going to say this even before you responded that heterogeneous networking is a big, big area, I think, for us to really get engaged in and have people doing more and more research in, in Uganda. Okay, I mean, what are the implications? How do we go about it? What are some of the solutions we should be providing to our telecom operators? So that even when we go to our villages, we are not stuck with looking for the next, you know, tree and so on. So there's a lot of opportunity in that space. You may not understand what I'm but uh, for me, I mean, this is a big, big area, and I wish more of our students, uh, and whichever, because we have multiple universities actually represented in the room. I didn't acknowledge that in the beginning, but we have people from different universities. So that is one big thing. The other thing from the response that you shared is software-defined network. Okay, that's another big area that I feel that as our students, as our researchers, uh, and I know we have some industry players here, I won't put them on the spot. We also need to be doing more and more work 
in that space. Because then it also helps us understand and address some of these challenges uh, from that level. So in the interest of time, I hope that by highlighting those two factors, you can take a degree of comfort that we can find a solution. Um, so that I can move to the next question because I'm mindful, I, I, I want Professor Rose to enjoy her stay in Uganda, however brief it was. So number three. Question three. Yes, please. Was after the answer. Ah, okay. That is the best. <laughs> 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 the question was, the question was, the cost of the employee, if I'm a service provider. Yes. The cost of the employee. Because people are not migrating to, to 40 people because of the cost. Yes, and because I think uh, cost implications is another big area for us to, to look at. What are the motivations? I had the students actually at master's uh, level try to understand a bit more that question. Uh, what is motivating movement from 3G to 4G? Uh, what do the operators need to do uh, to get us more into that space? Um, someone once said, you don't see people giving lessons on how to use mobile money. Why? Because there is a big demand from the user. And one of the earlier comments Professor Rose said was that we must move from network-centric planning to user-centric planning. And uh, I hope my colleague from RAN may also speak a bit more about this. But the more we actually bring human-centered design into the work that we are doing and understanding what is going to motivate people's willingness to pay. If I ask all of us here, do you have any money? You are going to tell me you don't have, all right? But then when you drive out, I'll see you buy a few, and I'll say, so you have money for what you believe you need, okay? <laughs> yes, exactly, so all these factors play into the, the cost. So something may cost 100,000, to someone it's no big deal, to someone even who has no money, they will spend it, and of course, for the series of this world, I keep saying I didn't find another example. Um, I mean, that's pocket change, even not even pocket change. Okay, so number four. Number four. Yes, please. I'm Raymond. I am interested in uh, the energy perspective in uh, 5G. Reason being, in the current cellular setup, what we know is if you take a phone, uh, when it is really consuming power, uh, the constant communications it's having with the base station. Whereas in 5G, I mean, I could have my gadget and people are communicating over it and it's losing, you know, uh, uh, it's losing energy, something like that. So its battery is getting depleted. I just want the energy bit of it, the perspective, how will these things work since it doesn't place the user at the center of managing. Uh, Managing communications over their device. Okay, I try to understand the problem here. So you are talking about the energy. Yeah. If I have my phone, mm -hmm. and I know I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk for 30 minutes on it. I know that probably there will be some rate of depletion on the battery, something yes. like that. I'm looking at devices in 5G. The fact that there are always communications going across these devices without even my authorization. So it's constantly getting related. I want to know, like, probably the, the energy field solutions for communications that are, it could be a little amount of power, 25 milliwatts, but always communication is going across these uh, devices. Are you talking about, for example, your device help other people yes. passing messages yes. and without you authorizing it? I, I don't know, like from, uh, say, the business or business perspective, uh, if that's an operating model or not. Say, your message is, your device is selective to do those kind of device-to-device -device communication. That's part of device-to-device -device communication. You, you, you are getting involved in either get credit or get direct pay from doing that. Then, of course, you know, if you allow your device to work in that mode, then, yes, energy could deplete much faster. Because you have to first keep your device always on. Today, for example, my device, if I'm not in talking mode, it just, you go to sleep. You can go to different levels of sleeps so that your energy can be saved. That's actually what we propose. That has been done a lot already in the existing wireless system design. But if you chose to say, okay, I want to be on all the time so that I can detect if any messages come in so that I can you know, help, then of course your battery will be depleted much faster than going to the sleep mode. But guess what? On the other hand, you, you get pays 
you get uh, credits of doing that, and that's what you're willing to do, right? You, that's what uh, the price you need to pay. And, uh, but the good thing is the, the, the factory technology has been improved a lot lately as well. And also those kind of bypassing, helping bypassing, because this is device-to-device -device communication, your energy consumed in communication will not be that high. But the energy consumed in, because just give you an example, he both are idle for some of your devices idle, not doing any communication. Going to sleep mode, compared with not doing communication, that, that are two different modes. And uh, if you are not doing communication, but still stay active, <coughs> say the mount is X, instead of you going to sleep X, the mount is Y. This Y could be just 10% of X, or 20% of X. I'm not sure if you know what I'm saying. So if you chose to be active, and uh, because you want to stay there to help you in relaying, I mean you want to stay in the X mode, right? Then of course yes, you consume your energy much more than go to the sleep mode. Yeah, so I know that there's also quite a bit of work being done, of course, in battery storage options and everything. But that's another area that I think within the East Africa uh, region, right. there's a lot of potential for research. Because how many times have you tried to reach uh, people who's, especially for those whose villages are also in the greater Kampala region, and they say, oh no, sorry, my phone was over, and, you know, it was in charging and everything. So even in the current setting, there's a lot of interest. Uh, a need for us to do research in the area of our food and battery storage uh, options. Okay, question number five, we're right back. Yeah. 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 And you need to manage all of them simultaneously because different radio access technologies have fulfilling different <coughs> requirements for different applications. So there is a lot of potential in network management because mm -hmm. there there are so many protocols and everything we have and probably students can take it down to see how can I manage these many networks in in the requirement requirement phase for the different applications. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point, and even from the, I, I say like from the COSI side of uh, things, or the IT side of things, these nice apps which show me, okay, uh, I'm making money, uh, or getting more airtime because I'm being used as a device, but what's the drain on my power? Yeah? So I can see like the, sort of like the yaka type of thing. Yeah, it's like, okay, you have these units, but you can see how they are uh, actually going down, and you can get a sense of if you're making, because if you wanted to do that, I think your motivation would be more around the business, uh, yeah, but how do you know that actually you are making business uh, as you uh, intend to be? Okay, so I'll take one last funny question because we really need to... Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, Jerome is my name. I have an example. When uh, applications like uh, WhatsApp came, they were able to make calls using data and video. But actually, there had to be a lot of code buttons because of those features. So as inquiring, with uh, 5G, you're able to call, like you're, you're roaming, you're able, to call your, you're able to call your neighbor. So will your service provider be able to know that you can actually talk to your neighbor? Oh yeah, that's what you want to talk to another user. You first have to uh, 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 let the base station or your operator know that you want to set up a connection. But once the connection is set up, your data path just directly goes between the two users. So that actually keeps your billing actually still under the service provider. And so I think that would be very good news for the operators because they would know that uh, even with the advances of the telcos, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that they yeah. still have a certain degree of control. And yeah. of course it makes you see and our government is very happy because they, they know they can tax the telecom operators and so everyone lives happily ever after. That's you know, because also you are making money. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, yes, you're yes, also yes. making money as a real device, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, so everyone now is making money along there. Yeah, along the chain. Okay, yeah, but the very, very last one. Okay, how, how would they handle lawful interception in that situation? So they will ask lawful interception. So if you have a call where somebody is communicating, the actual data path is between the device and the other device <coughs> locally. 
um, but the government want to monitor the call, the call to that particular user for, for whatever reason. Is there, is there a mechanism to say no relay all this traffic through the core? <laughs> To be honest with you, I don't even know today how government monitors things. <laughs> I was told they can monitor, yes. One day I visit, uh, uh, visit a service provider, that's what they told us. The government can monitor all commercial users' uh, uh, conversation. But I don't know how, uh, because I'm not working in that segment. But I think if for D2D, if they, they want to monitor, they certainly have ways to do that. I still believe that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd have to no, no, D2D, or... you can bypass space station, you can yeah. bypass you know, all the uh, infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. if you have two users that chose to talk to each other directly, if the government wants to monitor, they still can put the third party there, right? They can. I think they have all kinds of ways to do that. Yes, that's what I truly <laughs> No, I seriously, because I visited the lab and I was told everything. Everything actually, they can, they have the record there, they can interpret. That's actually to my surprise because I was believing that nobody can do that. But I was surprisingly, I was told that yes, they actually are doing that. Presumably, if there's a court order. Yeah. So, not just doing it anyway. so I think, yeah, if, they, if you chose to do that, you know, if you really want to monitor, you still have ways. Yeah. You still have ways to do that. Yeah. I think technology definitely allows you to do that. Yeah, so for the people who are into security, so we still have a problem. <laughs> um, I know that we also want to get very much into machine learning and AI, so I hope that for the people that are interested in that space as well, and actually we are trying to strengthen a collaboration with Intel. So I may get back to you for some more connections around your Intel oh, that's great. work and yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah so, I think it's a so good point, yeah, because yesterday at Kenya, I also see them ask about general topics as well, uh -huh. because it's, it's really becoming a good topic, popular topic. Yeah, yes. So, so we'll have that. So uh, I'll just ask you to take a short break and sit. Oh, sure, yeah. Study for okay. a while. I'm going to ask our host, yeah. Uh, because as you're aware, we are at the Resilient Africa Network, and I thought uh, it would be in order, right, they do it in the US as well, but certainly in Africa, you know, we fight the LC1, we the, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they own of their home and all those, you don't go to someone's space and walk out, you know, just like that, so I thought similarly it would be in order uh, that we uh, invite the director of the Eastern Africa RI Lab, which is where we are right now, to share with us. I think I've just given him a brief that for us here we have been talking technical <laughs> matters. Eh? Yeah, but for him it's more concerned about how to strengthen the resilience of people in Africa using innovation. So we have something we can discuss about. Uh, Nathan and Mohammed is the, the director. I will invite you to say a few words. I also invite you that we need to get Professor Rose to the air. Everyone has to be advised with that. So, Okay, yes, thank you, uh, Dorothy, and you're welcome. Oh, good morning, everyone. You're much welcome to run. Who oh, is not an engineer? Seems this class is for engineers. There are some non engineers. How many, how many of us are non engineers? I'm just kidding. 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 I'm just uh, brings in all the disciplines. When you're here, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a social scientist, whether you're from the communication for us, will come everyone. And the reason is very simple. The challenges that we deal with, uh, especially in Africa, or everywhere, do not require one discipline. Most of the engineers are used to technology. Is that is so? And do you know why technology is very low in Africa? Who knows? The biggest reason why technology uptake is very, very happy. It's because it is designed outside Africa and just brought here without considering the human centeredness of these what? technologies. And uh, that's what most engineers do. You sit in your labs, you do your work, you do your technology, you only interact with the user when your product is what? I wonder how you design these technologies without interfacing with <laughs> <laughs> then in the end, when it backfires, that's when you start regretting and saying, probably maybe if I, if I had interacted with these people, I would have been good. So 
then also for us here what we do is that we engage the communities in the design process and this uh, has different, I myself am a psychologist uh, we have a lot of other engineers, we have two engineers I think we have two doctors, we have communication, we have IT we have everyone here at Iran. so when you come here and come with your product irrespective of the discipline that you are coming uh, in with at least you have someone who will interact with you technologically or technically. Then when you need some human-centered design and how you can understand human behaviors in you know, advancing these technologies, we will say sure that you address that at the design process. And this lab is always open for everyone because I thought it's much disciplinary. Some people have been thinking it's only for public health because it's interested by the school public health. It's a big no. In fact, the biggest beneficiaries are from Dr. College, and we are yet to investigate. He's the director of the innovation. But when they come here, we usually have the challenge with them. They are into technology. But when getting them to the field that the design state has been very difficult, but because it is a culture here, you either go with our culture or you don't come. So you must design with the users at the beginning, even before you start investing a lot of money in your product. Please make sure that you interact with the one with the users. Communication, of course, I think we've been talking about communication several times. The way you communicate with the professor Rose is not the way you communicate with the user in the community who doesn't understand. When you talk about um normal. No. <laughs> <laughs> talk about that. Someone in the village may not understand. Some of you are into soul and what. If you talk about words, they don't even understand this language. For him will tell you I only need light. Or I need something. I have a fridge or I have something to do not use this solar for. But how do you communicate that to someone who's going to use that product? How do you explain this? At times we are too scientific when we are communicating. We need to even remove that science when you get to the community. And that will be social. That's why the social science is going to be very what? Important. And for you as an engineer, you may not know how to communicate that. And that's why when you come here at times, you, you can force you to you can understand it yourself. But you need the social scientist to be what? Your product. If the advisor did not take it, then we forcefully attach a social scientist to your product. But all of that is going to enhance the communication between your product, between yourself, and even the users, which is very, very important. So I think uh, we shouldn't take much time. This network is not only operating here in Uganda, it's operating in uh, 13 countries in Africa, but the headquarters is here in Uganda, and East Africa, which is hosting you, this is the lab. This is the training lab. We also have the, the lab, uh, the second lab hub, basically, which is for those who are advanced. Then you have your product, some of you don't have offices, but you need the working space. So the upper lab is designated for the working space, whereas this one is basically for the training. And everything here is movable, we design the way we want. If you're too many, we we'll move all these desks. Where we keep them, we may not know. But these are some of the things that we do at this innovation lab. We have outreaches, we have been reaching out to some faculties, but we also reach out to the communities to engage widely to ensure that uh, there is uh, this uh, kind of engagement as we design these uh, innovations. Uh, Prof. Rose, I think. Uh, as you interact with these engineers, encourage them to make use of the resources that we have here at the Resilient Africa Network, but also uh, the network that we have in the communities. We can link you to the communities. Our biggest uh, strength is that for us, everything we do we must interact with the communities. So uh, we also encourage you, if you want any advice on how you can engage uh, communities on the different products that you're working on, we are very much available at this space. But also, we have so many other things that we can do. When you have not reached uh, an advanced level of the silicon here, which we are trying to create here, but uh, we feel like in the near future we shall be creating that. We you know, also in the near future we shall have a bigger home, more than that. We have a dream home which shall be supporting innovators. 
uh, to IFI for you accordingly. Okay, so I want to thank you all for your very active uh, participation. We actually had to shut out so many people uh, who are on the wait list, but no one was dropping off, so uh, they, they remained on the wait list. So thank you for coming in and uh, filling up the space. Thank you. Thank you.